Over the last 60 years, over a thousand people have climbed to the top of Mount Everest. Hundreds of people have trekked to the North Pole. 12 people have walked on the surface of the moon. But so far, nobody's ever been to every country in the world without flying. Until now! Hi. <laughs> Hello there, my name is Graham Hughes. Um, on the 1st of January 2009, I set out on a journey, which is the fulfillment of a, a lifetime ambition. Ever since I was a kid and I watched Michael Palin's Around the World in 80 Days, and a little, little Graham there asked his mum, Mum, why does he go to every country? He just goes to a few of them. And she says, well, he's only trying to get around the world. He's not trying to get to every country. That would be impossible without flying. And through my life, I started, you know, graduated from university, I went backpacking around the world, I really got the travel book, really got itchy feet. And people I spoke to had the same attitude, you can't go to every country in the world without flying, you'll die, you'll get killed, you, you, you can't, it's impossible, the logistics just aren't there. I took this idea to newspapers in the UK and also travel blogs and said, I want to do this as, a, as, a, as an online adventure. And they came back with the same thing. They said, no, it's, it's impossible. You, you, you can't go to these places. You can't go to all of them. There's visa issues. How are you going to get to the islands? How are you going to get to Afghanistan? And so there was one group of people who actually agreed that I could actually probably do it, and that was Lonely Planet in Australia. And I had a meeting with them in 2008 in the summer, and they were the first people to say, go and do it. So at this point, I really had no budget. I didn't really know how I was exactly going to do it, and no one had done it before, so there was no reference book to look at. So I headed over to South America, and they declared on the 1st of January 2009, when I crossed the River Plate into Uruguay, that was country number one. And I started to make my way up through South America to the Caribbean. South America was easy, it was brilliant, there's coaches that go everywhere. I did all 12 countries of South America in two weeks. And then I had to start going through the Caribbean, and that's when the fun began because there's no scheduled ferry services in the Caribbean. There's a few, not many. And so I had to suss out how to get from one island to the next without flying. And this was done on a successive <laughs> conveyor chain almost of container ships, um, yachts, private sailboats. I even managed to blag a ride on, on a cruise ship overnight, which is amazing. And then I got to Central America, around Central America. I had a bit of trouble getting into Cuba because of the American embargo in Cuba. American captains don't want to take you there. But I found an American guy who was going to Fiji with his yacht. He was never coming back to Amer America. So he said, I'll, I'll take you over there. If he goes there, he gets done for trading with the enemy. I'm British, I can get away with it. So then I headed to Mexico, back to Mexico, went up through the American border. He said, well, what, what, the guy on the border said, well, what are you doing? Where, where have you been? I said, well, I, I left. Florida, and then I, I took a, a, a sailboat over to Cancun. You know, we went fishing. He said, oh, you didn't see any Cubans there, did you? I said, no, 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 no Cubans <laughs> whatsoever. Anyway, so then I headed over the Atlantic Ocean on a cargo ship to Iceland. Then from Iceland, went to the Faroe Islands, Faroe Islands, down to Rotterdam. And then I went all around Europe. As far as Russia, that was me. Uh, there was a little shot there of me wading across the Narva River from, from Estonia to Russia. This is important. I will come back to it later. Uh, Europe's amazing. For a couple hundred quid, you can get an interrail pass. And with that, you get 21 days, and you can travel as much as you like, pretty much. And you can get free uh, travel on, on the ferries as well. So I did that, and in just over about three weeks, I managed to go to about 45 of the 50 countries of Europe, including Vatican City, where I just ran, ran in and out. Then I headed over to Tunisia to try and get into Algeria and Libya. My plan was to go to the border, just kind of step over into the country, talk to the border guards, and then step back into Tunisia. That wasn't going to happen. The Tunisian border guards wouldn't allow me across the border. So I thought, OK, I'll come back. So I headed back into Europe, back around through Andorra, into Spain, Portugal, then down into Morocco and into Africa. Now, when I got to Africa, I was really excited. I thought, wow, we've done really well with the Americas. I've done really well with Europe. It's, it's only April, you know. It, it, I'll have done this in about maybe two or three months. In the event, it took till nearly uh, February of the next year. So it took 10 months for me 
to go to all the countries in Africa. When I got to Senegal, I had a huge problem. I had to go over to Cape Verde Islands. And this was the only way I could do it. It was on a, a, a pirogue, a fishing vessel with some Senegalese fishermen. We're well underway on our pirogue. And we're in the middle of open ocean, as you can see. I saw a shark earlier. I saw a shark fin. And you can possibly see how much we're rocking about. I don't know how far we've gone or how close we are. All I know is that I'm soaking wet. I'm filthy, my face is sunburnt, my feet are sunburnt, the back of my hands are sunburnt. Oh, so this is my bed for the night. I've got a, a yeah, what's it yeah. called? A, hello. I've got a life jacket as my pillow, and I've got my uh, sleeping bag, but my sleeping bag is soaking wet, as is my hair and all my clothes. Glad to know that I haven't been sick again and I'm keeping my cheery uh, disposition despite the fact that I'm absolutely shitting bricks. We're about 135 miles now from any kind of land. In the middle of the ocean, on a boat with 10 people who don't speak a word of English, and everything's made of wood. We don't have a sail or oars or a radio. Here we are, Cape Verde. Come on, guys, take us in before the police come and arrest us. So now waiting for the police to get on board. If only we were coming. I don't want to film them because you know what coppers are like with being filmed. There's a copper and there's a there's a, an army guy. At this point, Graham's camera is confiscated. Esta manhã no Porto da Praia, uma embarcação clandestina com 10 passageiros da costa africana e um inglês. Os imigrantes dizem que apenas acompanharam o europeu, que diz ser um aventureiro e que não pretendem ficar no país. Nós não viemos para cá ficar. O inglês pediu-nos para acompanhá-lo, mas depois regressamos ao Senegal. Não viemos aqui para viver. Os 11 imigrantes já foram encaminhados à esquadra de Eugênio Lima para prestarem esclarecimento às autoridades. Six days later, we were released from our single cell that all 11 of us shared for five nights. And I was stuck in Cape Verde then for uh, six weeks, actually, until these two guys, Milan and Sebastian, from uh, Germany and, and France, came and rescued me on their boat and they took me back to the mainland, back to uh, Africa. And what's remarkable about this is these guys came from another island to pick me up. And this is something that I found as I traveled everywhere. There were people who were willing to go that extra mile to help me achieve my dream of getting around the world. This is going through West Africa here. You can see some of the, some of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the road conditions that you have to go through. I was, I was at the height of the rainy season because of my uh, little uh, extended stay in Cape Verde sort of knocked my travel plans out a little bit. I wasn't hoping to be traveling through this part of the world at this time, but there I was. It's Nigeria, if you ever like the movies Mad Max, if you go down a Nigerian motorway, it's, it's quite similar. Uh, this is coming into Cameroon here. This is the main road, the main southern road from Nigeria into Cameroon. One of the big problems with development in Africa is, is getting goods across, um, getting them across borders. And this is one of the big challenges that I had. Obviously, I wasn't taking a truck. It was just me I'm on my own. But it was getting across these borders. It was getting the visas to each and every place. The Americas, you don't need a visa. A lot of places, most of Europe, you don't need a visa. Um, but in Africa, especially in West Africa, it, it, you need a visa for every country, you need to buy it in advance, and they can be quite expensive. And this became one of my biggest costs of, of traveling, because I was couch surfing, I was staying with local people everywhere I went, and that didn't cost anything. And then I was either uh, catching rides like this, or I was taking uh, local transport, public transport, which in most sensible countries, not this one, Public transport's pretty cheap and affordable. It's, not, it's about $1 to go about 100 miles through West or Southern Africa. I got to Congo, and there's a little shot there where I was escorted off the, the truck I was on by a police officer, and they, didn't, they took a dislike to me. And I hadn't come across smuggling people or anything like that in that case, but uh, they wanted to see from my tapes, because I've been filming all this stuff, 
and um, they ended up spending six days with me in a jail cell going through all my tapes, which wasn't much fun. But I got all around Africa, and at the end of the first year, I got to Egypt. And by then, I got to 133 countries in one year without flying. When I originally started on the journey, I thought it would take between 12 and 18 months to complete. So I was thinking, yeah, I'm well on my way. Another six months, I'll have this in the bag. There's about 200 countries in the world. And everything seemed to be going pretty well. Uh, this is me <laughs> in Iraq, you know, solo travelers. You'll have to be mad. That's the Lonely Planet guidebook there. Um, and I was up in Sulaymania in, in the north of the, uh, the Kurdish region in the north. And that was, you know, it was fine. That, that was when I went back to Algeria and Libya with visas this time. And this is going through uh, Azerbaijan and, and Armenia and then over the Caspian Sea into Kazakhstan and Central Asia. And once again, local people came, they looked after me, they made sure I didn't wander off into a minefield or you know, get into trouble or any problems like that. And it was just remarkable about how much this trip just reaffirmed my faith in humanity as a whole. I went through Afghanistan, I didn't suffer any problems, and this is me traveling on my own. I don't have a film crew with me, I'm holding my camera at arm's length at all times. I have, you know, this is uh, visiting Persepolis in, in Iran. This little uh, grandmother there that you just saw a flash of then, she was a little Persian grandmother who was sitting in front of me on, on an overnight bus. And um, we were traveling along from um, Shiraz to Khurramshah, which is on the Shatalar waterway. That's where you get the ferry over to Kuwait. And um, she, she was on the phone and she turned around and she, she didn't speak any English. She just pointed at the phone and gave it to me. So I, a bit of trepidation, put it against my ear and said, hello. And the guy on the other end said, hi, my name is Saeed Hussein and you're sitting behind my grandmother. And she's called me because she's concerned about you. And I said, what, what, why are you concerned about me? He said, well, she says the bus gets in very early tomorrow morning. It gets in about five o'clock and she's worried you'll have nowhere to go and you won't have any breakfast. So she wants to know if it's all right with you, if you come back to home with her so she can cook you breakfast, it would be an honor for her. I was just like, oh, thank you, you know, <laughs> okay, <laughs> amazing. So then I headed through the Middle East, I got a, a cargo boat to India, and then from there went over the Himalayas into Tibet, into China, that's right in China, and Chinese on my bag there, the Great Wall of China there, up into Mongolia, and then over to the Koreas, um, I, I cheated a little bit going into North Korea. There's me in North Korea there. There's, there's these five um, huts that straddle the border between North and South Korea. They're only a few foot wide. And there's a table in the middle and the table, half of it's in South Korea, half of it's in North Korea. And if you walk around the table, you're technically in North Korea. <laughs> so that's how I did that. And then down through Southeast Asia into Borneo. Here is my friend, the orangutan. He thought I was his dad. And um, they threw this to the Philippines. And then down into East Timor, and, and eventually through West Papua, I got to Papua New Guinea. By this point, I've been to 184 countries. I've been to basically all the easy ones. And then I got some really bad news from home. I've been traveling for two years at this point, and I found out my sister had been diagnosed with terminal cancer. So I flew home back to England and to spend, well, it was, it was quite uh, aggressive cancer. Uh, my sister didn't last much longer than the, after the, the diagnosis was given. And um, she said to me, Graham, don't give up. You've only, got, you've only got 16 countries left to go. Just keep going, just, just keep going and, and you'll finish it. And um, I ended up flying back to Australia on the way back to Papua New Guinea. And it was really hard to get back on the horse after this. I kind of wanted someone else to take the reins, someone else to organize things for me, be ringing up the boat companies, sorting out my next leg of the journey. And it took a, a long time. It took quite a few months for me to start the journey again. But when I did start the journey, it was amazing. And it was, I'm really glad that I finished this because no one wants to hear about the guy who went to nearly all the countries in the world without flying. You want to hear about the guy who went to Tuvalu without flying. This is the most critically endangered country in the world. If this was an animal, it would be on the endangered list because it's going uh, underwater and it's salty water. It floods every year now and salt obviously gets into the soil and destroys the crops. And they reckon by about 2020, the soil will be such bad quality that the entire population will have to be relocated to New Zealand. Um, this, is in, uh, this is in Fiji. This is, I was, I was the, it took another year to get just to Fiji. Um, and this is Christmas Day, and we made a, a lovo, which is, um, which is an earth oven. Looks like a giant Brussels sprout there. There's our Christmas dinner. There you go, I've got a special Christmas last. This was New Year for uh, 2011. 
And then, oh sorry, 2012. And then I headed over to Tonga and then New Zealand. Now my original plan was to start in Uruguay, make a nice little sign curve around the world and get to New Zealand, that would be my last country. But it didn't work out that way because there were certain countries that I missed along the way. That was my route all the way to New Zealand. I had seven countries left to visit. The little tiny micronation of Nauru in the Pacific Ocean, the Federated States of Micronesia. I also had Palau to go to, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, the Seychelles. Notice these are all islands and hard to get to without flying. The Seychelles especially because it's in the middle of the Somali high-risk pirate zone. Finally, I had to go to South Sudan. I had to go back to Africa. Even though I've been to all the countries of Africa, I had to go back because South Sudan had become a country while I was traveling. <laughs> So my nice round number of 200 countries around the world became 201, but that was fine. I took it all in my stride. This is me on one of the many cargo ships that I took. This is having a bit of a roller coaster ride in the emergency drop ship. Sometimes they go into the water and don't come back up, so it's a bit of a risk, but I made it. That was good. There's Nauru, uh, one of the last seven that I had to get to. And this is when we were crossing the equator back into the Northern Hemisphere. There's, there's old uh, Neptune there with his trident. And uh, I was painted red and, and green and had my head shaved. I was made to drink this noxious liquid, which is like salt water and vodka and apple juice or something. And I was given a good hosing down. And um, this, was, this, was, this was my present for crossing the Atlantic. This is the kind of fun you can have on a cargo ship. I traveled on about 20 of these. This is Micronesia. These are the huge coins of um, Yap Island. And this is Palau. This is Jellyfish Lake. If you ever watch a BBC TV series called South Pacific, you'll see inside that lake. It's amazing. So then I went through Sri Lanka to the Maldives, to Seychelles, and then back into Africa for the final country, which was going to be South Sudan, which um, it took a long time to get there. But on the 28th of November, 2012, I crossed the border into South Sudan, which is to be my last nation of the Odyssey expedition. OK, I am now in South Sudan, the 201st and last country of the Odyssey expedition, which I've been on for the last three years, 10 months, and 26 days. And now it's over. I finish it in the newest country in the world. Boom! <laughs> Here's to South Sudan! Woo! I am now the first person in the world to visit every country without flying. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Woo! Right, now for sandwiches. Woo! But the story doesn't end there. There's more. So at this point, I, as far as I'm concerned, had been to every country in the world. I'll press it again. Play, play my video. I can see it on that. There we go. So that's South Sudan. That was my route around the world. That's a simplified version. I decided, and in hindsight, this is a really good idea, to head back to the UK overland. So I went through North Sudan. There's the Pyramids of Mero there. Um, headed up through across Lake Nasser into Egypt. There's the pyramids at night. Climbed over the fence. Climbed up the Great Pyramid. In the middle of that, this is footage from the top of the Great Pyramid of Giza. Didn't get caught or nothing, which is good because there was a revolution going on at the time. Uh, those, are the, <laughs> those are the three Mohammeds that came with us. They're, they're getting down to pray there on the top of the Great Pyramid. Um, and then I took a, a ship over the Mediterranean from, from um, Egypt to Turkey. And then a bus all the way from Turkey to, to Germany, then into Brussels. And then I got the train back into the UK to be met with my, by my family and friends back in my hometown of Liverpool. They came in on the boat there and they gave me this welcome home. And then I got in touch with Guinness World Records and said, right, I've done it, I've finished. And they had a look through my record and said, hang on, you haven't been to Russia. And I said, I have, I have, I have I've been there. He said, no, 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 you crossed an unofficial border point. You're going to have to go back. So <laughs> after going to all these places at the end of January 2013, I got the visa for Russia, there it is, and headed back into Russia proper. It took over 12 months for Guinness to accredit my certificate for the Odyssey expedition. I got the certificate last week, special footage, I filmed this last Saturday. You're the first people to see it. This is me with my certificate. It is Saturday, the 1st of March, 2014. I've just been given my Guinness World Record certificate. I've had to wait 14 months for my record to be accredited. But here it is, 
So we've brought the people, my friends, my family who helped me along the way out to the pier head here to get a picture with it. So we we'll go back over here and just say I am and always will be the first person to visit every country in the world without flying. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs>